Hello, welcome to our latest Virtual Bridge uh, session. And today we're joined by Mark McCready, who is representing the British Esports Association. I feel, I feel that not so many people know that there is a British Esports Association. This, this, is, this is possibly news to many people. So I'm, I'm interested to see um, how esports connects with, well, education for one. Um, and also, you know, if you can give me a few tips of how to improve my score in Fortnite, you know, I'm, I'm completely up for that, Mark. So <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of getting beaten by my daughter. <laughs> so Mark, without further ado, over to you. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to, to sort of cover with esports and education. I think it's a bit of a, a foreign topic to a lot of people um, and how that actually translates directly into it. Um, but yeah, um, I'm the Scotland representative um, for British esports. Um, my role is basically to liaise with stakeholders um, within Scotland, work with a lot of the grassroots scenes, uh, a lot of the players and teams and also to work with a lot of the professional players as well. Um, so I'm actually working with the uh, British Esports on the championships that we run, which is a national competition where we encourage high schools and colleges to get involved um, as part of their extracurricular uh, activities at college and high schools. Um, should we just get into the... <laughs> The share screen section now, or absolutely, yeah. Let's present start. away. Here we go. Where is it? That's it. Yeah. So, go past the cover screen at this point. So yeah, I've I've outlined a couple of topics that I wanted to to talk about today, um, to hopefully give a bit of a, a broader understanding of. E what esports actually is to begin with, who I am and who I work for, um, and also how education plays a vital role within esports, and how esports plays a vital role within education too, um, and how colleges and high schools and also universities can take advantage of esports and what it has within the industry right now. So, like you said, British Esports Association. Um, we're the national body, not a governing body. Um, we've been around for about four years now, and our whole aim is to promote, inspire, and educate um, a lot of the different um, stakeholders throughout the UK. So we've got the likes of parents, teachers, um, the media, the government as well. So one of our main partners is the UKIE. Um, who we're a member of and we help support them with esports uh, up and down the UK. But our main goal is to primarily focus on promoting esports. Um, a lot of people still have a misunderstanding of what esports actually is um, and try to increase the level of awareness around it, um, along with putting the resources in place and supporting institutions to help esports too to a level where kids can actually get involved they can take advantage of uh, the resources that can be provided through schools and colleges and also out with schools and colleges as well because there's a lot of learning that happens outside the classroom which seems to go past um, and that's great to look at with the clubs and society section that we'll move on to at the end of this but i, I think the most important part is to inspire young people um, to go and chase what they want to do as a career. And esports to begin with was a bit, um, there was a bit of a, a sort of misty area to where they can actually have a full time career. But now we're actually starting to see that this is a, a career that people can actually enter into. They can actually make a full nine to five job out of this. Um, and there is a market of jobs in the UK and across the world. So what would you describe esports? Um, to me, I would describe esports as a subcategory of gaming. Um, it does fit within the gaming category, but it's a multiplayer cooperative game mode. 
um, where it's an organized competitive gaming. So it's a human versus human. There is no computers involved. So it's a solely human to human interaction in a virtual world. Um, because of this, it's usually putting people's skills up against each other to the point where you're trying to outsmart the other, your opponent essentially, or the other human being behind the screen. And it's usually enjoyed similar to traditional sports where we have spectators, we have analysts, data collectors, um, and a lot of spectators uh, that are watching from home. And sometimes in an arena league is shown on the picture. So there is a definite massive audience that's there. Uh, we've got an audience of 485 million people from around the world in, 20, in 2020. Um, and these numbers are starting to grow higher. It's actually just reached in 2019, the $1 billion mark. Um, and it's currently sat at that, I believe, COVID reasons, but that's yet to be discovered of what it's going to be at the final end of 2020. Um, but it's definitely a growing industry throughout the UK um, with about six and a half million people in the UK watching it as an audience. Um, and I think the most important aspect of that is the age group, which is roughly around 80, 18 to 34 years old where there's 65% of the audience in that age category uh, watch esports. So I think that's a huge aspect which gets looked over. Um, the audience is definitely there with younger people and it's engaging younger people. It has their attention. They want to get involved. They want to learn more about it. And that's a good thing. The one thing with esports that I would, I've, I've put in the middle in bold is that the spelling of esports is starting to matter. Um, it's had a lot of neglect throughout the past years um, where it's been thrown off as gaming. It's not something that kids should be interested. They should be discouraged to game. But in actual recent years, we've now encouraged people to game. We're now encouraging them, especially to implement it into their education um, through esports. But there's been a lot of variances within esports, and we're now starting to uniform that term of how you spell it. Because within the industry, there's a lot of um, professionalism and identity crisis around it. So now we have this uniform term of esports with a capital E at the start of a sentence or within a name, or just esports, all lowercase during a sentence. Um, there's clearly shown um, but that is a big aspect of even within education of having people spelling it right it can come across very unprofessional it's like spelling english at the start of a sentence without a capital e <laughs> um but i i think the the main process moving forward from esports is there's a lot of uh, learning curves within just a video game in general and especially when you bring in a human to human interaction, you're now starting to discover that it's very tough to beat somebody that knows the exact same about the same topic as you do. It's very similar to sports like football. It comes down to the minor details between players. It's like what makes Cristiano Ronaldo better than Lionel Messi. Um, and it's all down to how they play the game of football and how they understand and process it with their friends or their teammates around them. That's very similar to esports, where you have a five versus five usually, where they're competing against each other to try and destroy the enemy base or try to score as many goals against each other as possible. But within education, this is a, a sort of niche that we're now starting to, to venture into. Um, it does cover such a wide variety um of young people um i think one of the a huge aspect of this is it involves people that don't normally engage with physical activities um it has a very large mental stimulus where it engages a lot of young people that aren't really interested in football or rugby and it brings them into an area where they can learn they can meet friends they can meet like-minded people and it also improves their social skills and communication. So it's a really good 
area where you can bring these people in and get them interacting with education. We actually found this out from our British Esports Championship pilot that we ran in 2018. So before we launched the championships, we wanted to take a couple of co uh, colleges and high schools to the side where we can work with them more intimately on introducing a competition. So we, we ran League of Legends, Overwatch and Rocket League. So League of Legends is a five versus five. Um, best I can explain it is Dungeons and Dragons um, based game where they compete against each other to destroy the enemy base. Um, Overwatch is a first person shooter. It's a very cartoony character game. Um, it's very similar to League of Legends where there's an enemy base that you've got to destroy. And then Rocket League is more football based. It's more flying cars, three versus three um, within a dome, but the cars are rocket powered. So it adds an interesting twist to the game rather than just kicking a ball across the pitch like FIFA, for example. Um, but when we run them games, at the end of it, we put out a survey to the students and um, through the teachers. And 96% of the students said, we'd love to get involved with this again. Um, and we actually laid out a full report on what we could improve better. So the mistakes that were made and also the benefits of it that we've seen coming back. It encouraged people to get involved. Inclusivity, like I mentioned before, a lot of the students that normally wouldn't partake in football or any of the physical PE uh, education, they got involved and they wanted to learn more. Um, there was an interest around this area where we started to identify that students could actually learn a lot from just playing video games in a classroom setting where they can learn more about themselves at a younger age. They're improving their cognitive and perceptual skills. So they're understanding a lot more about how the game actually works. Um, and they're improving simple cognitive functions like their problem solving. Um, they're also looking at their short term memory and remembering what's happening across the place. They're communicating, which is the big one to me, I believe, is we're getting kids to communicate with each other with uh, their own terms within the games. Um, and I think with esports especially, each game's so unique. So there's so much to learn about each and every title that when you look at a, a career or a pro, like professional player, they're not, it's very difficult to jump between different games. A lot of people dedicate to one game because there's so much information to take in on that particular one. But with the championships pilot, we've seen a lot of people develop leadership and taking that front role to lead their team to victory at the end of the day and learn a lot more about them as individuals, which is a great thing to see. But there, that, once we'd actually finalized that pilot, we seen a lot of progress from it. And we really wanted to take that to the next step and introduce it into a championship series, which we now run and is going into its uh, third year now. So we're now just opened up the championship um, signups for teams to register for this upcoming year, which has had adaptions because of COVID. Um, but that, is, that will definitely be running throughout the 2021 um, academic year. Next would be the BTEC, which was inspired directly off of the pilot, where we identified working with teachers is a great way for the championships within the education setting. So the championship was run outside of school as an extracurricular activity. But what had happened was we're seeing a lot more signs of them being engaged within their educational work. They were, wanting, they were actually performing slightly better within work because they were interested to come to school to get engaged with these activities, which was slightly different from the activities being run at the school previously. So through our BTEC, we wanted to identify what sort of jobs within esports can be achieved. Um, and I'll actually move on to the next slide as I talk about this one. We wanted to base the BTEC off of what, what can you get a job 
in esports? Like, is there a job career uh, pathway in esports? And we identified a lot of different areas to where it can can come in, but a lot of these can be put under computing science and uh, networking, uh, broadcasting, production. There's a lot of key different areas here um, that we've seen and could identify that are benefits of people getting involved with esports. So we thought, why not use esports as a tool within education, which we'd normally use around business management? So why not put a, a, a case that or not a case study, a project for two students as part of their academic uh, progress where they have to set up a little business and where that would normally be around the area of a study, they can do it around an esports business and they can create it from their own perspective, whether that's a broadcasting company, whether that's an esports team. Um, and running all the social media, trying to get people involved um, and getting victories on Fortnite, as Kenji's saying. Um, there's a lot of key areas to where kids can definitely get involved. Um, and like we've said, there's marketing, sales, advertising, and these are all very key areas for uh, careers in the future. I think when I've been talking about skills as well, we're looking to, within, within education and within high schools and colleges, which is now going to universities as well, I think it's a little bit different with colleges and high schools, um, where we have, where esports hasn't got as much of a presence as it does in university. With universities, they have their societies and sports teams where the societies actually have are run by the students and are basically putting together the whole management side. So you have a committee being put in place that are fully student run. They're competing in national competitions across the country. They're also running social media. They're marketing what they're doing to students and uh, the audience around them. They're also liaising with the university and the student union. They're managing a budget. They're getting involved with different projects. They're running events. They're learning a lot of experience and skills throughout a society while they're studying the likes of human biology or they're studying their, their main focus, which could be like business or marketing at the site. But what that does is it identifies a key area which always seems to be a struggle nowadays of work experience they're getting first class work experience through societies and um, they're working with companies throughout the uk as well and that really does stem in to their academic links so when they go to a lot of employers nowadays to get employed they're wanting to do it through their extracurricular activities because they're actually getting a lot of experience that they would within the industry. And it's a safe place to do it. It's a safe place for them to actually gain valuable skills. So I think with introducing the BTEC in particular, where we can educate them on the fundamentals of these key subjects of um, business, marketing, they can learn a lot of the strategies and understandings of where to begin. Um, and I think that leads on to my point as well at the end, where education doesn't stop after the class. Um, I'm a firm believer that a lot of your education comes from outside, not within your actual um, course as well. I think there's a lot of key learning points from within your course that helps you develop yourself as an individual within that area and as a and as a person. But it's applying those skills into your life and into other experiences around you. And like I was mentioning with um, students getting involved with societies, setting up their societies, engaging with other students to create teams to compete, 
they are developing a lot of social skills. They're developing a lot of, about um, their characteristics. You're learning a lot more about them. And they're also getting involved with these national competitions. So they're also challenging themselves constantly throughout the course of the year. Um, these competitions are usually a year long. Um, they're usually splits into sections. So they usually run for a good two, two months, eight weeks, where kids can actually compete within a team, progress through to see where they'll end up. Um, usually within the Newland NSC, there's a, they have a knockout system where students will compete within teams for um, a set amount of time um, where essentially there's a there's an end point where the the most advanced teams will progress to the end where they'll uh, get into the top bracket you'll essentially so they they use something called a swiss system where what they do is they i'm kind of rambling on at this point <laughs> i'm not going to lie um but no with with um I think there's a lot of areas to cover with it and it's very easy to catch yourself up with esports in general. There's a lot of different categories within. And I think the main the main focus around this would be that with education, they actually have a, a, a good stronghold within society. You're also approving of gaming and that there is educational benefits to getting involved with a competitive environment like football a lot of kids are encouraged to go out and get physical activity, but we should also be encouraging children to get involved and improve their cognitive functions and skills. So they Mark, really should be getting engaged. Mark, I, I know that when we started talking about this, when I was introduced to you, you had told me that th there are a number of Scottish institutions that have done quite well in these national tournaments. Um, I know from, from my side, working with colleges, uh, Glasgow Clyde College, and West College Scotland have, have performed quite well in national games. Um, and I, I think we, we recently um, possibly uh, promoted a, a case study where Glasgow Clyde College had, mm -hmm. had done quite well in your championship. Yeah, so Glasgow Clyde has been sort of flying the flag for Scotland, you could say. Um, Glasgow Clyde have uh, put together a Rocket League team, uh, one of the games we discussed at the start that had actually made it to the finals of the championship uh, up against 180 teams uh, throughout the year. So they made it very far into the finals. And speaking to the likes of Kevin um, that runs the program at Glasgow Clay College, he's seen a lot of benefits from the, the kids as well. Um, they actually run an esports qualification uh, that they've designed on their own. And they've had a lot of uh, positive feedback from the students where they have got more engaged they've been more focused on their studies and wanting to improve um, and even from the case study alone there's been a lot of um, feedback where kids are now waiting to join again they're wanting to get more involved um, and a lot of them students are now going on to further education and they've now developed skills where they can now go out into uh, the working world um, and apply for jobs. I, so, yeah. I just, uh, please, any, anyone else can answer a question as well. Just unmute yourself and, <laughs> and jump in, sorry. But I'm interested, where does eSports sit in a kind of curriculum field? Is it, mm -hmm. Does it sit with um, computing science? Is it part of like the games development um, in, in universities such as Abertay, which obviously are, are quite mm -hmm. dominant and, and, and run like a, a center of excellence there? Does it sit with business? I mean, if it's more about events management, um, where 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 does esports sit as a as a curriculum entity? Do you think? From my my personal opinion, it would be it's it's sort of like a Trojan horse, if you will. It's a subject where it can be applied to multiple different areas. Um, from the the careers pathway, um, you can go through an entrepreneurship of setting up your own business. So you're gaining entrepreneurial skills. You've also got the business study side of things where you can learn about the actual running of the business itself. Um, 
you've got creative media where you have designers you've got um editors you've got the broadcast aspects of it you've got individual talent where it comes to casting hosting there's a it fits into a lot of different categories um i think it it's one to that's quite difficult to pin down um but i would personally say it would there there's definitely a lot of difference between them all you can run an events management course based around esports um you can also d- run uh, a business studies class around esports a creative media we actually have confetti uh, in nottingham that are now running an esports program around broadcasting and production um Staffordshire running a lot of different esports courses around uh, business events management as well um, and there's now a lot of universities across the UK that are now getting involved um, in running more generic esports instead of tying it in with computing science um, because there's a clear difference between the two as you're sitting down and trying to focus on esports and computing science. Okay um, just as, as part of this recording we probably have time for just one or two questions does anyone have a question they might want to ask mark you can just unmute yourself hey mark i just wanted to ask about like how much uptake you've had in the schools across scotland could you give a picture of that or yeah so this is we've only started no it's okay (laughs) um so for the, the first six months um i've been working with british esports from january um, and from January, we've already had, like we said, Glasgow Clyde College and West College Scotland. Um, but we're now starting to see schools getting more engaged. I think over the, the COVID period where we've had a lot of uh, teachers trying to figure out how they can do things online, mm-hmm. with this being an online activity that can also be adapted into a physical activity within a classroom, they now see an opportunity for kids to stay engaged whilst this pandemic's been going on um but we've definitely seen an increase in schools within scotland um particularly high schools i believe off the top of my head i believe there are 10 schools in scotland that have registered their interest um to get involved with the championships this year um we're not sure around the uh, b-tech and the education side of things yet we're still waiting for those numbers to be processed going through uh, Pearson and how do you sell it to parents that are always trying to get their kids off of games <laughs> 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 you know that's the issue for me personally I think there's um, speaking from uh, personal experience as well I think um, just sitting in the room and listening and watching what your kids doing um, another language just, to me yeah, it's, I think it's a lot of foreign ground. It's came leaps and bounds um, to where it is today. Um, and it's just sort of getting involved and understanding really what they are uh, involved in. Um, there is always the aspect of everything in moderation. Um, I think there should be strict limits on when kids should be getting involved and how much time they should be spending in front of a computer screen, um, especially in the development ages uh, through education. But I think these are key areas of understanding. It's instead of throwing it in a corner and leaving the problem to grow, um, I think it's a time now where it's just to encourage parents to talk to their kids about it, to ask them questions around so what's happening here like what are you actually doing uh are you just going up to play games are you playing with your friends uh are you playing with people from school and um, these are i think that's the key area is just understanding what they're actually doing in their own spare time and there are a lot of benefits that we've mentioned where we think gaming is very anti-social but in fact it's very sociable when you bring in esports because they are communicating with other people and they're gaining those vital social uh, social skills. Okay, so um, we're we're just coming at the end of the time for this recorded portion of the session, but it is interesting to hear about this billion dollar industry that's that's coming into our lives, uh, that more people are are, are joining almost every day. 
I know that a number of awarding bodies are following Pearson's uh, route and, and developing qualifications in this area around esports. That's probably all we have time for. I, I know we could have talked about lots of different things about some of the work you're doing about promoting uh, women in esports, that you're doing work around bringing um, local national championships into Scotland. Um, I'll have to save that for another day. Until then, <laughs> thanks for joining us at this virtual word, uh, bridge session and we hope to see you again at some future session. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe.